that's that's well said. Um, Kim's a Gloucester filmmaker. Um, she gave a presentation on the threats of the monarch butterfly, and she's a documentary filmmaker, environmentalist, conservationist, photojournalist, author, illustrated, illustrator, and an award-winning landscape designer. Uh, she's the producer of Beauty on the Wing, Life Story of the Monarch Butterfly, which is a narrated, released um, documentary in August last year. And uh, since its premiere, it's received a number of honors and awards at environmental film festivals and children's film festivals, including Best Documentary at the Boston International Kids Festival um, and uh, Best Feature Film at Providence Children's Film Festival. And she's also been recognized at the Toronto International Women's Film Festival um, for outstanding excellence. Um, so climate, Climate change, global climate change, along with microclimate change, have a profound negative impact on monarchs on their migration. And the monarch has recently become a candidate under the Endangered Species Act. So in some ways, there's no more urgent time than the present to learn more about how to protect them. So with that, um, Kim, I'll let you uh, get started. Uh, so Kim. Um, so thank you, Lisa and Cape Ann Climate Coalition for inviting me to present. Um, as you said in the introduction, I'm not gonna repeat everything you said, that was part of the um, what I was going to say, but I just want to let everybody know that um, for over two decades, I've been sharing information on how we can help the pollinators. So over the, over the course of that time, I've just learned so much and, um, but it's only since 2006 that I began documenting the monarchs on Cape Ann. Um, so the film was filmed in Gloucester and at the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserves in the state of Mexico and Michoacan. But it illuminates how two regions, um, we're separated by thousands of miles, but we are ecologically interconnected. So I just wanted to make a, you know, give a little description about the monarchs. Um, they are beautiful black and orange insects in the order Lepidoptera, which means scaled wings. And like all butterflies, their wings and bodies are covered with overlapping scales. The size and texture of um, very uh, delicate baby powder. Um, they depart their northern breeding grounds in late summer. And these beautiful winged creatures only weigh less than a paper clip each, but they journey several thousands of miles. So um, their arrival to their winter home in the Trans-Mexican Volcanic Mountains coincides roughly with the celebration of Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead. They spend the winter in a state of diapause and sexual immaturity at the reserves. And I'm, I'm just very roughly skimming over their life story. But um, by late winter, they become restless and pulled by the Earth's energy, rising temperatures and lengthening days. And using sun compass navigation, they depart Mexico in a swirling exodus. And this um, uh, slide illustrates a butterfly explosion. By the vernal equinox, all the monarchs have left the reserve and begun their journey north. Their first stopovers on their northward migration are in the states surrounding the Gulf of Mexico, primarily Texas, where they lay eggs on, um, they lay the eggs of the next generation on milkweed plants. Um, and you can see from this map that um, Cape Ann or our, the Northeast region is roughly 15% of the um, total monarch population. Cape Ann is part of the monarch's northern breeding grounds, and the butterflies arrive in early summer to mate and egg, lay eggs of the next generation. It takes several generations of monarchs to reach Cape Ann, but only one generation will journey to Mexico. And this very last generation of the summer, the Methuselah, or super monarchs, will complete the circle of the migration and depart Cape Ann and northern breeding grounds for Mexico in late summer. And these, these last, this last generation of butterflies is uh, very special. They live for about eight months, which is um, most butterflies live for about four weeks. Um, there are no other butterflies in the world that travel this vast distance. And it is a wondrous ecological link that connects central and northern Mexico 
and you were in southern Canada with nearly every geographic region in the United States. 90% of the monarch migration takes place east of the Rocky Mountains. We hear a lot about California, um, but that is only, well, it was formerly about 10% of the migration, but that their numbers have dwindled so drastically that it's, they don't even register. Um, and as you can see from the map, the Rocky Mountains act as a barrier for east-west population movement. During the fall migration, after crossing the central Mexican plateau, the transvolcanic mountains form a barrier for migration further south. In 1976, the monarch's overwintering locations at Cerro Pelon in the state of Mexico was confirmed by Professor Fred Urquhart from the University of Toronto. At that time, scientists were counting the butterflies in the billions. In less than 50 years, the population is now counted in the millions. In 2014, I traveled to Angangueo with um, Dr. Thomas Emmel. He's, he's the director of the McGuire Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity at the University of Florida. Dr. Emmel was, he's passed away subsequently, but he was a, um, a butterfly population specialist and had been traveling to Mexico since the late 1970s. You can find an interview that I made with Dr. Emil on YouTube um, when we were um, in Mexico at um, uh, Sierra Chinqua and El Rosario. Um, and in, in, in it, it's very interesting. He describes how, how you count butterflies then and now. So it's interesting to learn about the different way it's counted. Um, and then, um, in 2020, the monarch became a candidate to be listed as an endangered species. It will likely, it will, it's unlikely that it will become extinct because wherever the monarch has been blown off course and out to sea, there are many populations. We are, however, in extreme danger of losing the magnificent migration. The monarch has seen a 95% decline in the last 20 years. Uh, the graph shows how precipitously the population has plummeted. And um, this, is, this is the most recent graph from 2021. And then you can see um, what, dire, what a dire situation it is with the Western population. Um, this, this is from 2019. In 2020, they only counted several hundred butterflies. So they went from uh, over a million in 1970. 1997 to just a few hundred. The reason for the dramatic decline in population is fourfold. Warming and extreme climate. Number two, loss of habitat, which is also related to climate change. Number three, the use of herbicides and pesticides, namely glyphosates with the brand name Roundup and Dicamba. Um, well, now the next generation is Dicamba. And also the global pandemic is contributing to the population decline. The warming climate affects the monarch population in a number of ways. Like most butterflies, monarchs are highly sensitive to weather and climate. They depend on environmental cues, um, particularly temperature, to trigger reproduction and migration. In recent years, the monarch's fall migration from Canada has been delayed by as much as six weeks due to warmer than normal temperatures, which failed to trigger the butterfly's instincts to move south. Their migration has become out of sync with the blooming times of wildflowers that sustain them on their long southward journey. You can see in this photo, which I took at Stone Harbor Point, which is just a little bit north of Cape May. Cape May is a, um, is a wonderful um, migratory holdover um, uh, position for the monarchs as they're waiting for the right temperature and wind currents to cross the Delaware Bay. And so you can see that every, they were so late that all the, all the dunes and um, meadows were just covered with dried out wildflowers. Um, and it's, they, need, they need the wildflowers to sustain them on their, they, they're constantly building up their fat reserves when they arrive in Mexico, they weigh a fraction of what they weighed um, when they departed our shores. 
Additionally, hotter and drier weather conditions have proven to be lethal during the larval stage of the monarch's development with direct impacts on the survival and reproductive capacity of the adult butterfly. Climate change has increased the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, which has had catastrophic effects on migration and overwintering monarchs. Um, in 2002, a severe and sudden storm killed close to 80% of the overwintering monarch population, um, a blow from which the butterflies really have yet to recover. During the winter months in Mexico, the butterflies must, they have to maintain a fairly consistent temperature. Um, if, they're, if it's too cold, they're in danger of freezing to death. And um, if it's too warm, um, it's, they will burn up their body fat too rapidly. Um, the canopy of the mixed temperate forest protects the butterflies from freezing and from burning. Illegal logging changes the microclimates from found in the forest. And even when just a few trees are logged in a particular area where the butterflies are roosting, um, the effect is devastating. The pandemic has further exacerbated the problem of illegal logging as the villagers depend on tourism to provide for their families. Without tourist dollars, they return to the old ways of earning their income. Uh, when I was there in 2014, which was the year of the lowest population numbers ever recorded, we couldn't find the butterflies at the altitude they are usually found. We had to climb much, much higher up the mountains, nearly to the top. If the weather had been any warmer, the butterflies would have died as there was no place higher and cooler for them to go. Uh, 2020 was a terrible year for people and for monarchs. Um, in March of 2019, I traveled to Sarah Pallon. Um, everyone was really overjoyed that the butterflies, um, that there was such an increase in numbers that year. But then the, then the population again um, plummeted and fell 20 about 25%, um, according to the Mexican government and the World Wildlife Fund. Um, an unusually cold frost during the spring migration killed many of the butterflies. And then um, that was followed by a severe drought in Texas during the fall migration of 2019, which wiped out all gains. But it's not just in Mexico that the butterflies are losing habitat. Um, they're, they're losing habitat in all regions of their migration. For example, the Northeast is losing its fields and meadows. We have become much less an agra agrarian society and New England is becoming reforested. The same meadows and fields that support monarchs and many species of pollinators also make ideal sites for development of um, home housing developments and shopping centers. In the following two photos, you can see how beach raking negatively impacts vegetation and wildflowers at our dunes, and is one of the reasons why we are losing more and more beach every year. There's been a dramatic decline in wildflowers at our Eastern Point Lighthouse over the past 15 years. Um, I, I do have a dream to restore it to its former beauty, and I mean, just physically, everything's, the buildings are dilapidated, but also to create a wildflower center there. All around Cape Ann, non-native invasive plants like Rosa rugosa, which although beautiful, are not native, and um, they compete with native wildflowers, such as asters, um, that, that's, this is a photo of New England asters taken in Gloucester, um, seaside goldenrod, and milkweed. Wherever you see beech roses growing, know that the colony has displaced are native wildflowers. Vast areas in the agricultural heartland of the country grow Roundup Ready genetically modified crops, which allows for vast amounts of herbicides to be sprayed on farm fields. This modified crops, the primarily corn, soybean, and sorghum can withstand the toxic Roundup, but it is deadly poisonous to the wildflowers that support pollinators that grow in and around the fields. Um, the, the following are just some of some mitigation strategies. NGOs working in the biosphere reserves, they plant new OML fir trees, but these saplings take 30 to 40 years to sequester the same amount of carbon and to protect the butterflies. 
we don't have 30 to 40 years to save the butterflies. It's imperative that we protect the existing forests. Uh, my friends Ellen Sharp and Joel Marino, a Mexican-American couple living at Cerro Pelon, founded a nonprofit called Butterflies and Their People. And through their organization, they are able to fund six full-time arborists. And the arborists take care of the forests all year round. They help to prevent the illegal logging. They're trying to save the trees that are there existing now. It's it's not it's not easy to do this. They are you know constantly raising funds to um, to uh, provide to to support the arborist, and it's also very very dangerous. Um, this was a um, a gentleman. There were several gentlemen killed in 2019 for um, being outspoken about protecting the trees. So things that we can do, and citizens all across the butterflies range are planting milkweed and creating monarch quarters. Equally as important is planting nectar-rich flowers to sustain the monarchs on their southward migration. I designed habitat gardens so that no matter when the monarchs arrive or how out of sync they may be with the blooming times of wildflowers, they will always find sustenance appropriate to their seasonal needs. So um, if, you, if you, you want to provide for the monarchs, plant um, common milkweed and marsh milkweed. Those are the two best milkweeds for our area. But then you also want to have um, goldenrods and asters blooming for their southward migration. It's equally as important that they, you know, build up their fat reserves for their journey. Severe droughts are reducing the growth of vital wildflowers, um, limiting, limiting the monarchs as to where they can feed and reproduce. Habitat restoration could be the key to halting the monarch's decline. And, but we also have to engage large scale agribusiness. There's a new conservation initiative, Monarch Butterfly Habitat Exchange, and that's an example of an innovative solution. It was created by the Environmental Defense Fund, and it uses an advanced accounting method to measure habitat recovery, and assign credit values to such improvements. And landowners get paid for maintaining and creating monarch habitat. Um, and this has been, this is a, a proven um, and effective way of engaging the landowners. With everyone working together, we can possibly reverse the trajectory of this beloved and iconic species and help mitigate the impact of warming climate on the monarchs. Um, I, I hope you'll go to my film's website there's a lot more information. It's uh, www.monarchbutterflyfilm.com. And um, we're also, I have to um, add this, we're also looking for, um, we're having an online fundraiser right now because um, in order to bring a program to public television, it's a candidate for um, uh, public television and it would begin airing in February if we raise all the money, which the goal is $51,000. You have to pay public television for them to um, uh, market your film and bring it to a larger audience. Um, so public television um, will show, show it to 350 stations across the country, but that the cost of it is basically $51,000. So um, anybody's welcome to um, have a look at my uh, Butterfly Film website. And that concludes the presentation. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time. Thank you so much, Kim. We do have a few minutes um, okay. and we've got some, your, your comment, your invitation certainly do um, help people start pollinator uh, gardens and planting is is well received. There was a question about why uh, the West Coast population had shrunk so dramatically. Uh, so I think it's a number of reasons. It's um, so much development on the West Coast. There's also the extreme uh, forest fires, uh, which um, I mean, it was just so dramatic to see, you know, 29,000 and then after the, those uh, terrible fires, uh, all up and down the coast. Um, and another thing that's very problematic in the West Coast is that um, like with so many uh, species of vegetation, eucalyptus trees were brought to the West Coast as, and people thought that that would be, they 
that come from Australia and people thought it would be a great uh, um, wood for paper. Uh, it's, it's invasive and it's uh, grown, it grows everywhere now on the coast of California, but it's, and, and it's one of the main trees that the butterflies like to roost in, in California. However, it's one of the most extremely flammable trees on the planet. <laughs> um, the oils in the, uh, the eucalyptus oil is highly flammable. So there's, there's, you know, a, there's a challenge, you know, they, they have to replace these eucalyptus trees with something else that the butterflies can, um, can utilize to roost in. So it's part, I think it's mostly the extreme uh, uh, fires that they're having and the, just the wholesale development, uh, loss of habitat, um, loss of fields. Uh, that's, that, is, that is something that is negatively impacting butterflies and pollinators everywhere it is loss of fields. Mm -hmm. There's and another question uh, that Eric Hutchins had um, that he'd like to create a second milkweed patch on his property. Um, you know, and is wondering if there's a minimum size. He's got like 100 square feet. Is there, is there a minimum size or what would you recommend? This is no, just because this is pretty, you know, pretty specific. Nothing specific. You know, I do want to, um, I do want to tell people a trick about or a tip about um, milkweed is that um, the, it, uh, if you have a patch of 10 milkweed plants, you will get better. You'll get the monarchs. Um, but, the, but if you want them to reproduce on the plants, um, the main thing is you have to cut it back. So what I do is um, in the patches that I grow in my garden and my clients' gardens, I leave about half the stand up. And then um, I, about a month into the growth, I cut about half of it back down. So that, because uh, the females like to deposit their eggs on fresh, tender growth. They, um, they're not that interested in ratty old plants that have been you know, um, up for a while. They're kind of getting schlumpy and the, um, the bugs are starting to eat it. They want the tender shoots that are emerging um, fresh from the ground. So um, Eric, just do plant as much milkweed as you can. Um, marsh and common milkweed, they're the two best for this area. But then also in June, I would cut some down or, you know, mid-May, beginning of June, cut some down so that when the, the bulk of the butterflies that arrive to our area, which usually isn't until around July 4th, there's tender milkweed for them, not just um, these older plants that have been up and blooming for a while. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Kim, we're at about time. Um, and I think on behalf of everyone, I'm just, you know, really just moved and uh, appreciate the, the work that you've done and, and um, how much you've shared. And, you know, I, I know a lot of this starts with awareness um, and, and some small actions that people can take. So um, I think this will really be taken to heart. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.